about that time for us to get started. We just have a, a couple announcements this morning. First announcement is uh, Dot's little younger brother who is in hot he's in the hospital at Summit uh, with blood clots in his lungs following following having COVID. Um, he also has pneumonia. So if we can keep him in our prayers during that time as he recovers and deals with those things. Also, Pat Summit's sister-in-law is in the hospital. She's asking for prayers for her as well. And then Robbie and Cashton are at home sick. They have a stomach bug. And so they've been battling that for a couple of days. Are there any other announcements? You said Pat Summit. I said Pat Summit. Oh, <laughs> Pat Rowland. Yeah. Rolls off the tongue, I guess. Pat Rowland's sister-in-law. Is in the hospital asking for prayers. Are there any other announcements? We'll begin our worship and song. Number 800. 800. We'll sing the first two verses only of this song. <coughs> Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above while the light from the throne shines for you and me let us this to the call of love zion's call is ringing coming from the throne above while we Father, we ask that you would be with the ones that are sick, and we ask that you would 
you help return them to their wanted places in life. Father, we ask that you also, we also be with the ones who've lost loved ones. We ask that you would comfort them as only you can. Father, we ask that you would be with our nation. Father, we ask that you would help us all to realize the, the fallen state of, of this world and how much it's impacting our nation and how much we've turned from you. Father, we ask that you would, would touch the hearts of, of people that they may return to you before, the, before your wrath comes upon us. Father, we're thankful most of all for Jesus, and we're thankful for the, the hope we have through him. We're thankful for the example that he set for us so that we would know how to live our lives. We're most of all thankful for the sacrifice that he made that if we believe on him, that we can someday be in heaven and be with you. Father, we ask you to help us as we go through this service. We ask that you would Help us to keep our minds focused on you. It's a Christ in the prayer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Number 599. 599. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 only for this song. <clears throat> trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. Trying to follow our Savior and He. Shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Letting pass of life. Footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love. Looking to Him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy our journey of love. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, laying paths of light. Our song before the Lord's Supper this morning is How Deep the Father's Love. How Deep the Father's Love. This will be on the screen. We'll sing all three verses of this song. <clears throat> How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His fair
Father, we take this cup to our lips and we let our minds go back to the cross. To us, this represents the blood that Jesus shed for the remission of our sins. We just pray that we protect it in a way that pleases in our sight in a worthy manner until Jesus comes again. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Father, you bless us in so many ways that are blessed beyond what we can expect. We just pray that you continue to bless us as you see fit, as we stand in need. Now, Father, as we've laid by in store, we bring back the force of these blessings to carry on your work at this place. May we live cheerfully and liberally in the way that pleases in our sight. To Christ we pray. Amen. stand for our two songs before the lesson this morning. Our first one is number 865. 865. We'll sing all four verses of this song. <clears throat> I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Like river, I got joy like a fountain, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got peace like river, I got joy like a fountain, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Amen. I love that song. Our song after the lesson this morning will be 499. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of that song, and our song before the lesson is number 572. 572. We'll sing uh, verses 1, 3, and 4 of this song. <clears throat> There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless way. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. 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 Send
He had one slave whose name was Paulus. And he was a very trustworthy slave. Uh, he was so trustworthy that Proculus put him over his entire household. <clears throat> and one day, Proculus took Paulus to Rome to the slave market to buy new workers. Before the bargaining began, they were able to examine each of the men for their age, for their uh, stamina and things of that nature. Were they strong and healthy? Would they make good slaves? And among the slaves stood a weak old man. Paulus urged the owner to buy this slave. Proculus could not understand why. He said he is good for nothing. Paulus said, go ahead and buy him. He is cheap, and I promise that the work in your household will get done better than before if you purchase this slave. Well, Proculus was hesitant, but he entrusted this slave with his entire household, and so he, he trusted this slave with this decision. So Proculus purchased this elderly slave, and Paulus was good to his word. The work went even better than ever. But Proculus observed something. Proculus observed that Paulus was now doing the work of two men. The old slave did no work at all. While Paulus not only did his work, but the work of this slave, but also tended to him and to his needs. He gave him the best food and made sure that he had plenty of rest. Proculus was curious, and so he confronted his trusted slave, Paulus. He said, who is this slave? What value is he to you? I don't mind you protecting this old man, but I am curious. Tell me who he is. Is this your father who has fallen into slavery? Paulus answered, it is someone to whom I owe a greater debt than my father. So Proculus pressed on. He said, your teacher then. No, somebody to whom I owe even more. Who then? This is my enemy. Your enemy? Yes, he is the man who killed my father and sold us, the children, as slaves. Proculus stood there speechless. As for me, said Paulus, I am a disciple of Christ who has taught me to love our enemies and to reward evil with good. The philosophy of the Jews can very well easily be said to be the philosophy of modern man. You love your friends, you hate your enemies, and on the surface, that would seem like a very logical course of action. In fact, it is the main theme of most philosophy, it is the main theme of most worldviews, and it is even the main theme in most religion. Only in Christianity do we see this original thought and peculiar law. No system of religion but Christianity teaches us to love our enemies. Three short verses serve as the textual basis for our lesson this morning. The first one from Proverbs 25. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Matthew 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In the Old King James Version, Matthew 5, 44 is rendered this way. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
This morning, as we think about the command that we love our enemies, we need to evaluate this law. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We are told, that first of all, that we are to love our enemies. Now, let's, let's think about that for just a moment this morning. We are told to love them. We are not told to love their conduct, which might be immoral, ungodly, or hateful. We are told to love them. We are not told to love that about them which might be uncouth, obnoxious, or despicable. We are told to love them, not their companionship, which might be a bad influence, harmful to our testimony, or degrading to our own character. The fact that we are taught to love our enemies is not a reflection on their lives, their character, or their actions. It is a reflection on our lives, our character, and our actions. Not only are we told to love our enemies, but we are told to bless them that curse us. The Word of God tells us that we are not to trade insult for insult. The Word of God tells us that as Christians, we are to live on a higher plane. That does not mean that as we live on this higher plane, that we look down on other people. It does not mean that we act as if we think that we are better than other people. Indeed, we are not better. We are just saved. And we are saved by the blood of Jesus. It is not because of anything that we ourselves have done. Indeed, it is the grace of God. This word blessing means to say something good about them. If this is impossible, then we say nothing at all. This is where we turn the other cheek. Now I'm a firm believer that no one is completely worthless. They can at least serve as a bad example. But we ought to be the kinds of people who look for the best in others. And just because someone is an enemy, just because someone is unwilling or unable to see something that is good in us, we ought to be willing to strive and see the good in the other person. I believe that life matters. I believe that every person is made in the image of God. Not everyone lives up to that. Indeed, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Some people are not even striving to live up to that image of God. But nonetheless, the very fact that an individual is made in the image of God means that they are not a waste of breath, but that they have not come to a sense of self-respect, self-awareness, and God-awareness that would lead them to the cross for whatever reason. And one of those reasons may well be that we in the church have failed at conveying the Great Commission as we should. But regardless of the reason, we should strive to see the good in other people. And in the inability to do that, then we are called to turn the other cheek. Jesus goes on to tell us that we are to do good to those who hate you. No matter what they do to us, no matter what they do against us, our only answer is to turn good. Some people will say that this is called taking the moral high ground. Some people take the moral high ground so that they can further look down on other people. That is not what the Word of God calls us to. Hating an enemy will certainly never make him a friend. Loving an enemy just might. Hating an enemy is going to damage our testimony as Christians. Loving our enemy is not only going to strengthen our testimony, but it is going to further validate the very Word of God. And fourth, Jesus says that we are to pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us. The Christian answer to deceit, the Christian answer to backstabbing and backbiting, the Christian answer to gossip according to, and these are red letter words, these types of things 
is prayer. And I would challenge you this morning, and not only do I challenge you, but I challenge you to prove me wrong on this. Try praying for someone and hating them at the same time. Try praying for someone and hating them at the same time. Something has got to give. If you are praying for someone and hating them at the same time, something has got to give. Either your hatred will fall or your faith will fall. You cannot pray for someone and hate them at the same time. Something must give. Now you might say that this is Jesus asking an awful lot of us. But let me remind you, and you know by now, that this is one of my fundamental themes. Jesus Christ never asked us to do anything that He was unwilling to do Himself. And let us remember that while He was God, He was also man. 100%. We cannot negate Jesus praying, Father, forgive them on the cross, for they know not what they do. We cannot negate that statement and that prayer based on the fact that He was God. Jesus struggled. He struggled in the garden. Jesus struggled as He was beaten. He struggled, but He succeeded because He went through those ordeals without sin. And so the same Jesus, yes, who called us to love our enemies, loved His enemies. The same Jesus who blessed those who cursed them, Him said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with Me in paradise. The same Jesus who told us to do good to those who hate us, picked up a bloody ear and reattached it. The same Jesus who said, pray for those who persecute you, forgave Peter when he looked him in the eyes and denied knowing him. This is the Christian law of enemies. It unsettles us. It makes us uncomfortable because it goes against our fallen human nature. It goes against philosophy. It goes against worldviews. It goes against every other system of religion on the face of the earth. It goes against what our friends and neighbors oftentimes do. But the Word of God still calls us to it. Why? Why? If it is human nature to hate your enemies, if hating your enemies is what everyone around us is doing, why does Christianity call us to be so counter? Why does Christianity call us to open ourselves up to being vulnerable and to being attacked? Well, there are several reasons that I can see for this. The first reason is it is designed to make us more like God. The Word of God challenges us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I know we've discussed this before, but let us remember that the Greek word for perfect doesn't carry with it quite the same intonation that we use with the word perfect. When we think of perfect, we think of flawless, we think of sinless. These are the words that we think about. The, the word that is translated perfect in Greek has more of a meaning of completeness. And, and so some people will look at the words of the Bible, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and they will say, I cannot be perfect. And you are exactly right. You and I cannot be perfect based on the American definition of that word. You and I will not be flawless. You and I will not be sinless. Not going to happen. But we can be complete. And so this law of enemies is designed to make us more like God. Look at the very next verse. We've been camping out in verse 44 of Matthew 5, but look at the very next verse. 
Why do we do these things? So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And, and so, in so much that God sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, another way of saying that might be both his friends and his enemies, both the faithful and the faithless. If this is the God that we serve, then He calls us to the same thing. Look again with me at Proverbs 25. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, water to drink. And so again, when we choose to love our enemies, we are becoming more like God. God's Son gives light and warmth to the evil as well as the good. God's rain falls on the evil, the undeserving, as well as the just. We might say the more deserving. God allowed men to ridicule, torment, torture, and kill His own Son. And yet He sent love instead of hatred. We sometimes sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels. But He died alone for you and me. What was God's response to man's rebellion in the garden and throughout the entire Old Testament? What was God's response to Israel's rejection of God's only Son? John 1.14, He came to His own and His own received Him not. What was God's response to that hatred? It was love. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. He sent grace instead of revenge. He sent mercy instead of anger. He sent love instead of hatred. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet He did not open His mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So He did not open His mouth. Backing up a few verses in Matthew 5 to verse 39, we read this, Do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him as well. And, and so this law of enemies is designed, first of all, to make us more like God. But secondly, it is to separate us and to set us apart from the rest of the world. You know, one of my favorite words is the word holy. And the significance of that word. And again, in our American thinking of things, when we hear the word holy, we have a tendency to think of, of something that we cannot approach. Something that we cannot enter into the presence of. We think of, as in the temple, the holy of holies. And no man could go into the holy of holies. In fact, even the high priest could only go in there one time a year. And, and so that's what we think about. Something that is is uh, unapproachable. But, but the definition, the Greek definition of the word holy is something that is simply set apart. It is something that is special and set apart. And that is what God has done to us. You may not think of yourself as being holy, but in God's eyes, you and I are holy. We have been set apart. Specifically set apart from destruction. Because at the second coming of Christ, we will be caught up in the clouds together. The sheep and the goats will be separated. And, and so, again, we need to get outside of this American definition of the word holy and understand what the pages of Scripture are truly trying to teach us. The problem is God has set us apart. The question is, are we living lives that are worthy of that set apartness? There are things in my man cave that you could say are, are holy. They are, they are special. They are set apart. I have my grandfather's cane that he walked on, a, a wooden uh, cane that I refinished, and it is now hanging up on, on the wall. It, it's not just thrown in a closet somewhere. It's, it's proudly displayed. I have my father's slingshot uh, 
that is that is up there on the wall. You could say that those things are holy. They are special. They are they are set apart. You and I are holy. We are special. We are set apart. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, Peter reminds the church, as I remind you this morning, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So yes, this morning you are holy, you are set apart. The question is, are you living like it? Saw this the other day on the interstate. I love things that just don't quite register with me. This is one of those things that doesn't quite register with me. I saw a brand new, gorgeous, black Cadillac sedan. Had the upgraded chrome wheels. The insanely large chrome grill on the front end. The crystal clear headlights, the long skinny taillights that are supposed to be reminiscent of the 1965 Cadillac. You know the one, the one with the insanely large fins on the back. Gorgeous vehicle. Best paint job on the planet. The black paint job looks like it's about six feet thick because of how deep and pure the paint job is. Absolute gorgeous car. Pulling a U-Haul. <laughs> if it was a Cadillac SUV, I might be willing to give the benefit of the doubt. It is an SUV. But a Cadillac sedan, it, it, that, uh, my mind exploded right there on I-40. I just I could not wrap my brain around that. Question is, in God's eyes, you're a Cadillac. Are you living up to it? Or are you treating it like a 1984 Chevy Silverado? He wants us to be separate. He wants us to live lives that are separate. Again, let's go back to Matthew 5. Now verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do this? How can we expect a reward for doing what is easy and what is natural? There are those who are needing constant affirmation and praise. When I was an employer, I would always have someone coming into my office needing to be validated. Needed to be validated just for doing their job. I always had a hard time with this. You know what your participation trophy is when you're in the workforce? It's called a paycheck. That's the participation trophy. If, if you want praise, Go above and beyond the call of duty. How can we be claim to be children of God if we act exactly like the children of Satan? If we have a kind word and a good deed only for those we love, how does this distinguish us from the vilest God-hater who does the same thing? Even the publicans do this. The most despised people, the most hated people of all the citizens in Jerusalem. They did this. And yet you are holy. You are separate. You are apart. So the purpose of the law of enemies isn't just to make us more like God. It's to separate us from the rest of the world. And then finally, it's to make us perfect, complete, full grown. Look with me at verse 48. Why the law of the enemies? Jesus sums it up in verse 48. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We can never gain the respect and obedience from others if we do not live as we ought to live. We can never conquer an enemy or win a man 
that hates us to the Lord if our tactics and our attitudes are the same as His. We will never be profitable servants of God and become spiritually mature until we learn how to love our enemies. In speaking on this verse, Albert Barnes, the famed commentator, said this, He that can meet a man kindly who is seeking his hurt, who can speak well of the one that is perpetually slandering and cursing him, that can pray for a man who abuses, injures, and wounds him, and that can seek heaven for him that wishes his damnation is on the way to eternal life. This is Christianity, pure like its source, kind like its author, free like the Jews of the morning, clear and diffuse like the rays of the rising sun, and holy like the feelings and words that come from the bosom of the Son of God. He that can do this need not doubt that he is a Christian, for he has caught the very spirit of the Savior. One of the things that troubles me are people who embrace the words of someone but have failed to grasp their meaning. How many times have we read or memorized the words of the Bible and yet failed to grasp their true meaning? Here's another example of that. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. This morning, have you accepted the love of God? Have you accepted His salvation? Have you repented of your sins, confessed Jesus as the Christ and have your sins washed away through baptism? If not, then I encourage you this morning to accept the love of God. And then if as a Christian you've not been loving your enemies, you have bought into the philosophy and the worldview of our world, you have embraced not the teachings of Scripture but of other religions that teach us to hate our enemies as well. We are never more like our Lord than when we turn the other cheek and when we can pray for our enemies. Yes, love them. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer.
is number 647. 647, we'll sing the first and fourth verses of this song, The Love of God. <clears throat> Since the love of God is shed, Christless blessings on my head I have paid in my own. I will hide it in my heart that it never may depart. It shall rule, it shall rule there alone. The love of God within my heart will kindly end and work the heart. The soul will glow like Jesus. And his tender mercy, if the heart is made, his blessing flex the love of God.